Welcome back to Beyond Well. This is a special Valentine's Day edition, everyone. I think we should have some sexy music playing in the background. I've heard people say <laughs> Brian, really, did you bring Barry White? That is so wonderful. I love you for doing that. Thank Dr. You. Brian Goff with the background music, always ready. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. Hi. Uh-huh. And the glass of red wine. Mm, right here. <laughs> yep. Glug, glug, glug in the background. <laughs> and introducing Dr. Angela Ismerian sitting in for Jenna while Jenna is gone gallivanting through uh, Spain, I believe, right? I think that's right. Yeah. I'm so jealous of Jenna, but I'm also so unbelievably happy to have you here, Angela. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's um, I First of all, I always love to ask the question about why psychologists got into the field of psychology. So give us a little background on you. Um, that's an interesting question because I remember early in high school, I was trying to figure out what major to do. And psychology was just the one that, in my opinion, captured everything. It had art. It had language. It had science, if you really wanted to go down that route math and the core of it, which was helping people. Because I considered, you know, med school, I don't know, psychiatry, but then I wanted to just help people by being present and there with people. Yeah. And psychology fit the bill. What kind of specialties, if you can say that, because of course, most psychologists are capable of doing everything, but what yeah. kind of specialties really, really float your boat? I have a few. I would say first, and the one I've most recently kind of dove into is Uh, couples therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things where I kept having clients, especially the individual clients, just come in, talk to me about their partners. And then I would, I would throw out suggestions, listen to them, validate them, and then think about how can I help them impact their relationship? But it's so hard when the other person's not in the room. And so I kept thinking, okay, relationships really impact your mental health. Mm. They, you know, make you feel connected, make you feel loved, feel like you were supported. And then when they're not going well, it's the opposite. You feel alone, you feel depressed, anxious, stressed, and you might be grieving a relationship. And yeah, I kept thinking I need the other person in the room in order to really make a difference. This is so. fabulous to have her here for this conversation, Completely. especially today, yeah. starting out, huh? Perfect timing. Um, can you just give me a little bit about your background? Were you raised in the Oregon area? No, actually, I grew up in uh, Glendale, California. So I'm one of the Californians who moved up to Oregon. <laughs> um, but And didn't well, change your license plate quite fast enough? Luckily, I went a different route. I went to Tennessee because that's where I went to oh, my yeah. PhD program. So there I came go. in with a Tennessee license plate. <laughs> oh, you little trickster. I know. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's um, really awesome. Yeah. Um, so let's begin, if if we can, talking about the psychology of desire, and especially in, in relationship to couples. And I don't want to assume that we're talking about heterosexual couples. I want this to be a completely inclusive conversation. If you're in love with someone, we, you're included in this conversation. And please forgive the pronouns if I if I screw up because I mean everyone really here. Yeah. Um, I think Angela's point about relationships are so singularly important for us as human beings that if we are in a relationship that is not going well, I think it is more lonely than when you're alone. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Have you heard people say that to you? Like, I'm in this relationship and I am the loneliest human being I've ever been. Absolutely. I mean, it feels like if you're alone, there's no one there to see you. And if you're with somebody and you don't feel seen, you feel invisible. Right. And that's, that to me is worse. Yeah. Yeah. But Angela's point is so good. Um, where relationships so often begin is somebody saying, I need you to fix them. And the whole point is we're kind of here to fix ourselves, right? Yeah. But because Angela, Angela is saying in order to work on this relationship thing, it's got to involve both people. There's something about, I mean, there's one approach of he's a jerk or she's impossible and people come to individual therapy and they complain about their partners. I get that. But then to say, no, 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 you just take care of you and then everything will be okay is is almost just the reverse uh-huh. of the same thing. And it's, there's some stuff, some magic that goes on between the two sides of the road Yeah, that needs to be in the room, I think. So let's let's go back to the beginning when there's all the desire mm-hmm. and talk to me about the psychology of desire. Where does it come from? What does it emanate? Why are we so hardlined to fall for desire? Oh, that's a great question. I think desire really changes throughout your life, especially when you're younger. We usually think of 
oh, desire is just going to pop up. It's going to just spontaneously be there. And when it might fluctuate throughout your lifetime, you might think, oh my gosh, I have a problem. I'm not desiring as much as I used to. Is this something wrong with me? Is this something wrong with the relationship? But every person has a different way of creating desire for themselves. And so I will put the caveat out there. I'm not a sex therapist, but again, I can talk about sex. And the two types of desire that I really resonate with or that I really believe in is we have the spontaneous desire, the one that it kind of just pops up out of nowhere, pops up in your head like, ooh, I just thought about sex and now I want sex. Um, And then there's the opposite, which is more responsive desire. So something outside happening, let's say my partner comes up behind me and then, you know, massages me or does something that makes me think about sex. Mm. And then then I think, okay, now I want sex. Mm -hmm. And so it really will depend on who you are, what kind of gets you going, and then what your partner does for you. And and you've talked about sex in both realms there. I mean, you've talked about desire in both realms as being um, tied to sex. Do you think desire is always tied to sex, Brian? No. Yeah. Uh, that was actually going to be my question if if uh, the ball had gotten bounced over here. <laughs> I would have said, well, <laughs> are you talking about sexual desire? Or are you talking about longing or desire yeah. or yearning? Because I think that's, I mean, to me, there, there certainly can be the, I'm just in the mood. <clears throat> and... Uh, or something's happening and it feels sexual and I like that and I desire that sensation and all of that. But then there's also the yearning and the longing and the connection and the mm-hmm. sense that this other person is an accelerant or a filter through which I experience other things. They bring a certain light to me mm-hmm. that changes the way I see things. And I'm so drawn to that and it that the desire is really, I think, more emotional, more partnered. I'd say deeper, although I don't know that that's maybe the right word. And then I think from that, there's often a desire for connection, whether that's emotional connection or quality time connection or connection sexually. I love um, talking about this in both realms because if my like very blank understanding of desire is anything, it's that everyone gets to enjoy this rush, this early rush where desire is just like overwhelming. It's all you can think about. The serotonin is just like jamming your brain and all you want to do is just one more round with your partner. And then eventually, and who knows how long that takes for some it's weeks, for some it's years, that sort of peters off. And if you're lucky, you get to rekindle that next kind of desire, which is partnering deeply, intellectual desire, longing for one another's company like that, that feels to me like even more exciting, but I don't know how you guys feel about it. Is that sort of rote uh, framing of the of the two types of desire fair? Yeah, that only clarifies more sexual desire. Yeah. Um, if we're thinking more emotional capacity, I think I agree completely with Brian. This is a whole other camp where I think about the desire of fully being known by the person that's across from you Mm. and then them accepting you despite your flaws actually because of your flaws really i think that's probably the type of desire that can be everlasting and ever changing yeah Yeah. Um, i think that's what i think of as intimacy exactly Mm -hmm. vulnerability plus acceptance and there's plenty of people who are having plenty of sex that don't feel intimate Mm -hmm. I, i think the, the question, Sheila, that you asked, and I sort of wonder this, I don't have a great answer, but whether it always or whether it normally starts with the passionate sexual draw and becomes something deeper, or if sometimes it happens the other way around, mm-hmm. the, the, yeah. the love and the longing and then the desire and the sexual desire towards somebody that you didn't necessarily see as a sexual partner yeah. initially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why a lot of best friends end up going, what the heck are we doing in bed and having such a good time? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And Which I is think, wonderful. And I think sometimes people, you know, wonder, you know, have I friend zoned this person, I think is the term, or have they friend zoned me? And because I want to be with them, but I don't want to have sex with them right now, or I don't feel, not that I don't want to, but like there isn't that draw, there, that pull that I guess that means we're not compatible. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's true either because it's more about, in my opinion, the attachment you have to the person. Mm-hmm. It's recognizing, are they there for me? 
like if I am dropped in some way, will they catch me? Mm. And then usually with enough experiences, the attachment grows. And then sometimes that's when the physical attachment grows or the mm. physical desire grows. Mm. Um, but I think it will depend on the person. Some people start with the emotional desire and then get to the physical. And then some do the opposite. Start, start with the physical desire and then realize, wow, I have so much in common with this person. I feel so attached to them. Huh. Yeah. I, wa- I want to talk about in, in the beginning phases um, of this, like attempting to create a healthy relationship with this other human being. What are some of the hallmarks of relationships that end up being able to move from just the desiring serotonin craze into true intimacy? I think, so the few things I would say, again, I'll sound cliche, communicate, 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 because the biggest thing I tell people is, you know, no, your partner can't help you work on a problem together if they don't know what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And then how you communicate is probably the most important piece (laughs) Um, because you can say like, you're lazy or you're not doing this enough for me, but it's more about what are those deeper emotions? Like, I'm, I don't feel cared for. I don't feel important to you. I don't feel loved. Mm. Um, and getting into that deeper place where you can actually talk about, the, this is what I need. This is what I'm feeling. And make it very specific about the specific behaviors your partner might be doing. And so, let's say, like, I know it's small, but when you don't pick up the clothes off the floor, it really makes me feel like you don't care about me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas you could say, why are you being so lazy? Yeah, right. Um, but, yeah. And the response to that, you know, you, you said communicate, communicate, communicate. And I was thinking like, oh, shoot, I know there's a lot of people out there who communicate a bunch, mm-hmm. but the style of the communication is intense or critical, blaming, mm-hmm. defensiveness. You know, I don't really feel cared about by you. Well, that's crazy. Of course I care about you. Exactly. I don't know what you're talking about. Give me an example. And you get enough of that and it's either a fight or it's a give up. It's like, never mind. It's probably just me. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the result of the kind of communication that I think we're talking about is what you had said earlier about like, that leaves me feeling seen and known and accepted. Yeah. Do you both agree with the idea that in couples there is a love language and that we should recognize the way that our partner is attempting to try to speak to us through through his or her love language? I do. And I say this with the hesitation because I don't think it's the, like, number one rule you have to pay attention to. But what I tell folks is really think about how you feel love and then how your partner feels loved. So, for example, I have taken this quiz multiple times, the five love languages quiz, which is available online. And I got physical touch and quality time, which I feel comfortable sharing. Mm. My partner had the same first two, which is really helpful. It makes your life really easy. Super easy. Yeah. Lots Um, of touching going on. (laughs) Exactly. With the Valentine's. Cue the music, Brian. (laughs) Yeah. Hold on. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But then I think where I notice our difficult or our differences really is um, like our third level of love languages. And that's for me is like acts of service. And for him is uh, words of affirmation. And so Mm. I have to be really aware of, it's not natural for me to go, I love you. You got this. Have a great day. For him it is because that's how he usually feels love. Mm. And so I have to just be really aware of, you know, he might be having a hard day. And so this is the day where I throw out the words of affirmation. Oh, how wonderful. And then for me, it would be, he may not necessarily think about it, although he does a great job. It's like, maybe I need to do the dishes or help with the laundry or mm-hmm. clean up the house because that's how she feels loved. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so- One of my friends said the biggest aphrodisiac her boyfriend ever gave her was when he loaded the dishwasher <laughs> and did it the way that she did it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that says so well, much, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, I've taken the quiz too. And, you know, I don't really, I don't want to say too much here because I don't know how scientific that yeah. that division of these five languages are, how much overlap, what, how much they change, whether there's actually five. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of beside the point. There's some intuitive appeal to it. And you can think of couples that have a decent sex life meaning they're having sex at a pretty good frequency, but one of the two of them doesn't feel close 
they are like, yeah, we're not really that connected. I mean, we we have sex, but, you know. Yeah. But the other person's like, I think we're doing great. Mm -hmm. And not because it's like I'm, you know, shallow, but that might just be this is the way that I communicate my love. Yeah. And the other partner's like, where's the quality time? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, yeah. Where's so, the quality time? And, and so then physical intimacy becomes a byproduct of those other things. When you're helping me carry my load, whatever that looks like, when we are logging good quality time together and connecting in maybe the world of ideas or just sharing space and being able to look out in the world and go, wow, at all the stuff that's out there, then I'm kind of in the mood to look at you and say, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things for younger people in particular when they're first in relationship is how do I maintain my sense of self without being completely dependent on my other person? And I see it a lot in, in young love where especially women have been having tons of fun with their friends and then suddenly they get their first boyfriend and it's sort of like, and you're in the vortex of just, and then like six weeks later you wake up and you go, what happened? I kind of lost myself to this human being. How do you suggest that um, we all maintain a, a healthy sense of, independence at the same time allow ourselves to be slightly codependent oh that's a great question <laughs> I, I have a thought about that okay and that is uh as you describe that i'm thinking about these different domains of my life things that are um important to me yeah. so my career my my family my friends a partner my own personal learning and growth and so forth and it seems like the one that you feel, this is my case, this is certainly in my case, I try not to overshare here, but like uh, the, the area in my life that feels the least fleshed out, the one that's kind of struggling more, when I get a toehold in that, it's easy to put all of the energy into that mm. because, because it has felt wanting. You know, and so like people get a new job or they get a promotion and they lose themselves in their work. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, they've got some, you know, they're recovering from something or their knees jacked up or they're training for a, a race because uh, they're a runner or something. And the rest of their life gets kind of put on the shelf. Yeah. Because this thing is like crying for their attention because it is underserved. And at least for me, I think maybe one of the things to keep in mind is as as incredibly important as this is, and at least the way I'm wired, the idea of partnering is, feels so important because of the value of just connection and belonging with someone. Yeah. But even though that is important, if that's getting knocked out of the park, but my health is poor or my career is flagging and I'm, I feel less engaged and it doesn't feel as meaningful or my relationships with my kids is suffering. It doesn't matter how fantastic that domain of my life is. These other areas of my life need my attention. Yeah. yeah. And as a result, if the other areas start dwindling, the stress, the anxiety, the sadness that comes from those domains will seep into the relationship because it's all interconnected. You bet it is. And so if you're unhappy yeah, at your point. job, then eventually you're going to maybe vent to your partner about the job and then they're going to see like, oh my gosh, like the happy-go-lucky, confident person I was in a relationship with is now really sad mm -hmm. and and vice versa. One thing that I was hoping to do today, especially when we're talking about relationships around Valentine's Day, is to try to end kind of the myth about couples counseling. Because I think in like modern day TV and maybe in books, a lot of people think that counseling is like when you've done something really bad and you're just about to break up and you need to see a counselor. And so I'm dragging you to counseling, right? I think there's the potential for so much growth. So if you go in there as loving partners trying to learn how to be better partners, and that's the time to go when your relationship is so good, right? completely agree there are so many folks who come in basically on the edge of divorce and, uh -huh. and those are the ones where i'm like oh this is gonna take so much longer and it's gonna hurt so much more because there's so much history that's already led into it yeah and so it's it, yes the earlier you can go in the better because you can solidify that attachment to the partner hopefully figure out what your dynamic is yeah. and what the parts you want to change early on mm -hmm. and then you 
are just happier for a longer period of time. Yeah. So many couples just come in saying like, oh, I wish we did this earlier because then we would have had more happy years together Yeah. instead of just going through the turmoil. And Brian, just in closing, you said something last year that I really wanted to bring back up again, oh which boy. was, um, you know, especially with young people, you see them, they kind of create this list of here's what I need in a partner mm -hmm. rather than a list for here's what I need in myself. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important to change the lens a little bit? What shows up for me as I, as I hear you say that is if I've got a list of what I'm looking for in a partner, then I'm shopping for like a product, you know? And the question is always, you know, was well, there a better product out there? Is there, is there some, is there somebody that has, you know, all nine of the characteristics instead of the eight or is a little bit better at this or that? And, and if my focus is on me, and what I mean by that is how I want to be in a relationship, mm -hmm. how I want to be even just in the world, then finding someone is about, is there somebody out there that magnifies these areas of my life that I care so much about? And I'm mm. like, you know what? Not only do I love you, but I like me a lot better. Mm. And I just sort of like the world. I like the way we do life together. And I'm just, I'm better off by a long shot. And I want you to be better off because of me. Yeah, that's wonderful. I also just want to add, you know, my area of interest and my entire reason for doing this program was as an attempt to try to reduce the suicide rate. And there's such clear data now between the epidemic of loneliness and um, suicide that I always feel like it's important to say the the bad rap that people give relationships, that they're too much work, that they're expensive to date, that they're it is bogus. We need human beings in our lives. We're, we're mammals. We are meant to pack. We are meant to partner. We're meant to be with other people. And I don't know if you have any other thoughts around that, but the people that I see that have told themselves that they're just fine being alone and they don't need friends and they don't need um, partners end up in a place that is not that great. It really is not that great. Yeah, it's not how I'm wired. But I understand the impulse to say this hasn't worked and I have gotten hurt by this. Yeah. So I'm going to preemptively decide that I don't get the stuff that feels really, really important to me because at least I chose to not have it than that it got taken away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when people opt out of relationship or opt out of connection or opt out of love, it is an attempt to avoid pain, but they're in my in my view, and I don't want to say this for everybody, but I think for some people, my view would be that they are building their own pain by preemptively deciding that they're not going to have this thing that matters to them. I mean, they're making that decision because it hurt mm -hmm. to lose it, and you only hurt about the things you care about. So if you decide not to have it, that means you're deciding not to have something you care about. about. Wow. Anything else, Angela? That's exactly what I was going to say. You have to be willing to experience pain when you want love it's mm -hmm. as it's like a coin metaphor if you want love on one side usually pain or suffering is on the other just just naturally how it is because you care about it so i completely agree but if you take yes and if you take an interest in um finding out about someone learning about them knowing them and you are paying attention to how you want to move around in a relationship and how you want to move around in the world it might feel a little less threatening, the the risk, the danger. Mm. I have loved having you in studio for the first time, Angela. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Our new co-host, Dr. Angela is Miriam. Her love communication style is touch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Dr. Brian. <laughs> Dr. Brian Gobbs, so great to be with you. Great Beyond to be Well with is you. brought to us by the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care and Cedar Hills Hospital. And if you want to find out anything more about either of those wonderful organizations, please click on the links below. Have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Thanks so much, Angela. Thank you.